This is the 966, episode 14, Richard. A different format this week as we Excellent. welcome guest uh, co-host from Riyadh, Fahad Al-Maliki. Fahad is an attorney with deep Saudi capital markets experience and is managing partner of Suhail Partners, LLP. This week, we will be talking about the Tidal Wool IPO on the Saudi Stock Exchange and some other capital market stuff. Interesting stuff there, a shill uh, gas play in Saudi Arabia, and then we'll nerd out a bit on the Saudi economy in 2022. Before we get started, I'm going to shorten the usual preamble here uh, because we're a little bit tight on time. Uh, but just thank you for all those who have subscribed to this podcast. And for those of you who have not, it's easy and free wherever you get your podcast. So smash that follow button for the 966 boys. Richard, uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, what's your one big thing this week? First of all, I'm really excited to have Fod with it. He's an old friend and, and he's not old, but he's a, he's a long time friend. Uh, extremely knowledgeable uh, and in, in general a, a really informed, perceptive individual. So this is this is I'm very excited about uh, Fahad being with us today. So and in his honor, I, and, and it's one of the things about Saudi Arabia. There's so much going on. I, I was thinking about the F1, which is pretty cool. The Jet F1, the the Red Sea uh, Film Festival, which has announced a number of things. But we're going to go with stuff to do in Saudi Arabia this December. Um, so nice. <laughs> There's a lot. Yeah, there is, and these are mostly in Riyadh, which is why I wanted to get uh, Fahad, who's a who's a, a resident of Riyadh. All right. So uh, one of the three pillars of Vision 2030 is to create a more vibrant society, meaning the improvement of citizens and residents' quality of life to include increased cultural and entertainment avenues, and healthier lifestyles through sports and recreational activities. One gleaming and supersized example of this is the 2021 Riyadh season, which began on October 20th and will go for five months until mid-March 2022. The Riyadh season program, under the slogan, Imagine More, will feature 14 zones, nine of which are already open, and offer up to 7,500 event days with 64 to 70 hours of programming available each day. Uh, these events include 70 Arabic concerts, six international concerts, 10, uh, 10 international exhibitions, 350 theatrical performances, 18 Arabic plays, and six international plays. It's been one WWE championship thus far. Fahad, I assume you won that. Um, 100, interactive, <laughs> 100 interactive experiences in addition to 200 restaurants and 70 cafes. Now, I know you've gone to the restaurants, Fahad, because uh, I know you like to eat well. Uh, Riyadh season 2021 attracted 3 million visitors in its first month and hopes to attract 20 million visitors for the entire season. So the Riyadh season 20, 2020, 2021 is not just fun rides and fine dining. Numerous cultural events are ongoing. Uh, the fifth edition of the MISC Art Week, an annual week-long program of exhibitions being staged by the MISC Art Institute, uh, begins on December 1st. Riyadh Art Build is the largest public civic arts initiative of its kind in the world. is running from December 5 to 8. It will feature 12 programs launched by the Royal Commission for Riyadh City to transform the Saudi capital into a gallery without walls. Uh, not to be outdone in Jeddah, the Jamil Art Center is scheduled to open its long-awaited uh, arts complex on December 6th. The annual Red Sea Film Festival, which features emerging talents from Saudi Arabia, the Arab region, and developing world, will run from December 6th to 15. Then back to Riyadh, something you touched on earlier, Lucian, the Daria Contemporary Art Biennale opens on December 11th in the New Jacks District in Daria, home to the UNESCO World Heritage Site Al Taraf, the first capital of the Saudi dynasty. Uh, this is slated to be the biggest attraction in the Riyadh season 2021. So I'll stop here. I mean, that's plenty. Uh, but just enormous uh, opportunities for entertainment and culture in Riyadh ongoing right now. Uh, Fahad, and, and I'm not sure if you've been able to get out to any of these, but is, is Riyadh pretty busy? Uh, it is busier than anyone can, can imagine. But before that, thank you so much for, for um, hosting me and giving me the honor to be with you. Um, uh, and we are all friends, but uh, you just want to... And, and Richard for this. Um, uh, now, it is busier than anybody can imagine. I have friends. Uh, I actually, I don't, it's not that. I was in Jeddah on a business trip. Um, uh, it, it was a day trip on a Thursday. 
Um, so uh, I went in the morning to Jeddah, and it was kind of a regular flight, not to to not um, too full, but on my way back from Jeddah to Riyadh, it was fully packed. Um, and, and I thought that people were in business in Jeddah and they were just coming back for the weekend to their families in Riyadh and all of that. And that was my first assumption. Uh, I had a conversation with a friend of mine whose family actually lives in, in, in Baif, which is on, on the mountains, uh, just an hour drive away from Jeddah. Um, and he said, no, there's actually the, tr- the tourists coming from Jeddah and Mecca and Taif to Riyadh because of what's happening here. Uh, and uh, my mom was on, on, a, on a similar plane and she said it's fully packed and his mom wanted to come and see what's going on in Riyadh. Um, his mom is neither liberal nor orthodox. She just wanted to see the mix between the two. She didn't want to go to the concerts, but she didn't want to go to the mosques. So there are kind of that blend for her that she can go to the kind of the cultural heritage festival festivals that cult- cultivates for her age kind of uh, um, segment. And this is the beauty of what's going on in Riyadh now, that it entertains everybody. It, it accommodates everybody. Um, uh, the, the right, the left, and the center, in a sense. Um, and, and what this is makes our lives as, as consultants, whether legal or other, otherwise, easier, in a sense. Because when we try to market or convince um, our audience that you need to come in Saudi, it's different, it's changed, judicial, whatever that is, they don't take us seriously because they see what, what the media markets in, 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 in a global scale. Uh, just one invite, just one kind of uh, to one of these pop-up restaurants or one of these shisha lounges or one cigar uh, 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 cafes. And they see us say, OK, it, it seems that this is different. I don't see why I'm getting my news or information from um, that tweet or that uh, um, kind of uh, um, uh, news outlet. But... Uh, it is giving that convincing message that this is a new nation, this is a new um, platform to, to do whatever you want to do with it, uh, whether uh, accept coming into it, be a tourist, be um, whatever you have in mind. Um, so it is not one bird, two birds, ten birds, it's thousand birds, one stone. That's, you know, it's one of the things in talking with Fahad Nazar in our feature uh, podcast last week. Uh, one of the things I mentioned is that uh, certainly in America with regard to Saudi Arabia, people may hear it in terms of change, but they don't believe it. So it's always, you know, maybe they just have to come and see. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Lucian. So, uh, I, yeah, so my one big thing this week, I'm going to keep it short. Um, I yeah, did, mine, was, mine I, was pretty long. <laughs> so hopefully, maybe maybe shorter than yours. I don't know, but I'll, I'll rip through it. It actually does touch on the sort of Saudi image in the United States, but... Um, Two, actually really three big sports stories in Saudi Arabia this week. Two golf-related. Those are the ones I'm going to focus on. The third is the first F1 race in awesome. uh, Jeddah, which awesome. is awesome and is a, its own story. But we'll, we'll get to that next week. Um, this week, some of the biggest names in golf committed to the Royal Greens um, tournament that Saudi Arabia will be hosting, its annual tournament uh, in January. Um, this is sort of fits into the larger story of the... PGA tour in the based in the U S and, um, the Saudi international, which is part of the Asian tour now. And there's sort of some ongoing competition, but the reason why I mention it, um, is because the list of players that have committed to play in Saudi Arabia is just a list of all of the best golfers in the world right now. It's Dustin Johnson, Bryson DeChambeau, Phil Mickelson, Tommy Fleetwood, answer Casey, Sergio Kokrak. It's a who's who of golf. And so this is the latest uh, I would say step up in sort of the battle between the future of golf. And the reason why I mentioned it is because Saudi Arabia is sort of in front and center in this issue. And this issue really touches many Americans lives. Like uh, I did a little social digging golfdigest.com and golf.com both have mentioned Saudi Arabia's golf ambitions heavily on their social media channels. Recently, yeah. there's a whole golf world of social channels, but these are just two that are the most widely followed. Golf Digest, for example, has 1.3 million diehard golf followers. Um, that's just one example. So there's a lot of visibility for Saudi Arabia right now in front of an impressionable American and global sporting audience. Um, and so it's sort of interesting. The upshot, um, and I'll wrap it up with this. The other story is uh, Greg Norman did an interview with the Financial Times this week. Really interesting comments there. Check that out. Yeah. Um, but the upshot here is essentially, I think golf has a lot of room to grow as a sport. 
Um, if you want to watch golf right now, there isn't a lot going on. If you want to watch golf in January, other than the Royal Greens, <laughs> there isn't a lot going on. So uh, this is a sport that doesn't need an off season to me. So um, there is tremendous opportunity to grow. And um, we saw some players come out today, express interest in the tour. Um, Rory McIlroy was the latest to say, we are independent contractors here. If we'd like to play, you should let us play. So Saudi Arabia um, sort of kicked the ball back over to the, the PGA um, in terms of what's going to happen next in this escalating thing in the golf world. But I, I wanted to make it my, my thing this week because it's just front and center in front of many Americans right now. So do you golf at all, Fahad? Uh, not at all. I caddy, but I don't golf. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really good to know. <laughs> um, that's let's a good one, Lucian. Uh, thank you. Let's get started uh, with the Tatawool IPO. Uh, Saudi Arabia's stock market is going meta by IPOing on its and listing itself on its own exchange. Um, the Saudi Tatawool Group's shares will be listed on the main index of the Saudi exchange. Earlier this month, uh, the Tatawool got approval for the IPO in what could be one of the biggest uh, in the exchange sector globally since Euronext and V's $1.2 billion listing. Fahad, um, you're a capital markets expert. Um, I'd sort of like to kick it to you. Um, there is a lot going on right now in the IPO space in Saudi Arabia. I mean, there's been a big run of them. Um, the latest is uh, a Nomu listing, the parallel market uh, for Riyadh-based food delivery firm Jahez, uh, which competes with firms like Hunger Station and others. Uh, could you talk a little bit about all the stuff that's going on in the IPO market in Saudi Arabia right now and um, just sort of the vibe in the, in the sector? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, thank you so much for tossing this and bringing uh, tossing this over to me and, and bringing this uh, uh, into discussion altogether. Um, Tadawal subscription has concluded today um, as as of, I think, or actually it still has until the end of the Saudi day today, which is in, in five hours or so. Um, and if our calculations are correct, I think the valuation of Tadawal plus listing will be uh, circa $3 billion. Um, uh, because they are offering 30% of of, uh, of Tadawal at uh, at a price range of $30 per share, more or less, or $20, $27 per share uh, for the 30%. And that brings the valuation of Tadawal to approximately $3 billion plus minus um, 3 4 5%, um, which is kind of substantial. And Tadawal, I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, is the seventh or, or the eighth main market IPO or uh, prime market IPO this year. Um, of of evaluation um, uh, or, or with market uh, subscription in the range of uh, in, ex in excess of two hundred and fifty million dollars, which is a lot of money being um, uh, collected, and the institutional subscription into the Dowell has ex exceeded one hundred and twenty multiples, so uh, one hundred one hundred and twenty times over subscription um, uh, uh, um, uh, for the institutional investors, which tells you the appetite uh, uh, of, of by the sophisticated. And knowledgeable and and uh, uh, well educated investors to uh, invest in in the Saudi stock exchange, uh, let it be uh, local or international, um, which is kind of the direct answer to what's going on in the capital market in Saudi. Um, I think the capital market has reached a certain level of maturity um, nowadays, uh, where it, it is giving the comfort and confidence of of investing um, into it. Uh, Historically, it used to be um, a retail-driven market, um, and gradually over the past 15 mm -hmm. to 18 years, it has shifted from one segment to the other, um, where I remember when we used to practice 90% um, of subscription into new IPOs used to go to retail, and 10% shy of 10% used to go to institutional. Um, Tadawal has kicked off with only 10% going to retail and 90% going to institutional investors. But because Tadawal is BIF-owned, and it should be for the welfare of the uh, of of the commons and all of that. It has increased the uh, the kind of uh, public subscription to thirty percent. So this is the I think if you go to the root of all or the cause of all troubles is that um, the govern the regulator uh, themselves has focused or on on governing the market properly and the corporate governance of the of the institution itself and that cascaded down to all of the listed companies, um, uh, which gave more trust and confidence into it. And then they, they looked into it deeper and they said, there are companies that are worth listing, but they are not worth listing on the prime market because they are too small or too little and we are too strict and too 
um, uh, kind of uh, rigid about uh, our rules and regulations. So they, they carve them out into new move or growth market or the parallel market. And this is where um, kind of the less compliant or the less um, uh, strict um, companies are, are pushing their IPOs into it. And just today, uh, two, two companies have been approved to go into new move. Um, and on weekly basis or by weekly basis, you see a new company being approved to be pushed into new move uh, or growth or the parallel market. One of that is Jahaz, and Jahaz, Jahaz is the Aramco of Nomo. So as big as Aramco <laughs> on the prime market, yeah. um, Jahaz is, uh, is, is going to be uh, the biggest company to be listed in Nomo. Its, it's valuation is quite high, um, uh, but um, for whatever reason they've decided to do, uh, for, uh, we're not involved in that, and we haven't seen the prospectus yet or the documents. Um, it's a smart move, uh, just like as smart as Aramco has done to the Saudi uh, um, uh, TASI index when they entered into what they elevated the whole TASI index into a global scale um, and uh, they are giving their perks and their kind of uh, uh, preferences uh, because they are doing the favor to, to TASI. Jahiz, I would assume and presume, but I'm not uh, making any uh, um, uh, decisions or uh, 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 representations on behalf of any authority, I would assume that they will be elevating Numu into a different level and then they will upscale, be upscaling everybody with them on that uh, uh, market or the parallel market into what is being perceived as secondary market, which is secondary, but secondary in terms of, of, of quality into secondary in terms of the level of the company, but it is quite a um, uh, uh, competent market given that Jahaz has listed into it. I hope that addresses your, your kind of uh, point. You know, that's really interesting. You're, you're pointing out the evolution of the market from retail to institutional. We had an earlier episode where we talked about the stock market crash of 2006, when the stock market at that time was, was really hugely speculative and almost completely retail. Um, you know, a lot of teachers and cab drivers and, uh, you know, all sorts of, you know, people who were just sort of speculating every day, day traders. And you know that crash, and then uh, 07, the, the, the DAO was established, and then 2015, you know, the, the qualified foreign investors were allowed, and then 2019 made part of the MSCI Emerging Index Markets, and it, it went from 76 companies in in 06 and a, a market cap of about 800 billion to today 202 with a market cap of about 2.3 trillion, and it's the ninth largest stock market in in, in the world, and it's it's. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's, as Lucian has said in the past, you know, you got to start somewhere, and they started somewhere in, in 07 after the crash. And uh, it's now become, what's interesting, is a really viable source for, of capital for private companies. I mean, you, this year, al Najm Foods, Thieve, Rent-A-Car, and Arabian uh, Contracting Service have all listed. But it's also allowing government-owned companies to go public, like Aqua Power and Tadawal. Uh And it, it's just really been... Uh, you know, when you look at it as a, you know, it's a 15-year process, basically, from 06, it's, it's been pretty impressive. I couldn't agree anymore. Uh, uh, from, from, if you put yourself in, in the Saudi company's shoes, it's, it's not only capital. It is capital for the strictly institutional companies, uh, which is a group of shareholders coming together. Uh, Saudi... Uh, it is as big as Texas, and it, it is Texas. It is it is a family business uh, society. Um, so the stock market uh, has played on a very, very, very brilliant and shrewd nerve when it came to uh, convincing companies to list. So this year it was Almonet Gym. Last, uh, last year it was Bin Dawood, and the year before it was um, a couple of family businesses. They did go and present to uh, family businesses, how do you guarantee continuity? How do you guarantee sustainability? If you, so they did sell that angle that for family businesses, if you list, there is that guarantee. Uh, whatever happens between the family members, there is that regulator kind of angel protection sort of thing um, uh, and that perspective. And this is kind of helped in elevating the market as, as well and elevating the family structure uh, uh, in terms of investment and the merchant families in Saudi as well. And you'll see in 2022, um, a lot of this shift as well from family business, from being concerned and, and reserved into coming openly to the public, uh, uh, showing their wealth and listed for, for that reason as well. Um, uh, I, I, I would consent and concur with everything you said, Richard, yes. 
Well, you know, let me let me take that opportunity to talk a little bit about what you've just done, which is fascinating. So you you've been uh, a partner, a managing partner for uh, Aldeban uh, Law Firm, which is a, a large Saudi firm with a with a, a partnership with Evershed, which is a huge global law firm, and you've just left them to start your own shop, Al Suhail Partners, um, which is all Saudi. And can you talk a little bit about why you, you chose to do that? Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't see that on the agenda, so I'm being caught. It's not on the agenda. That was, <laughs> yeah. that was a surprise. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, it, 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 sure. it, it speaks, I think, to the changing, uh, it speaks to the opportunities that were uh, available in Saudi Arabia now that weren't 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I remember I was having a conversation with somebody and who kind of, I, I'm not opposing any, any statement here, but I just kind of, um, I'm opposing the misstatements. So uh, they were kind of saying, stating that this nation is the land of opportunity or that, that destination is the land of opportunity. And we were kind of driving here and we had in one of the Giga Project venues and it was kind of we uh, next to each other. And I, I, I told that individual and proudly, uh, saying this statement, my father used to be a baker, um, and he he was illiterate, and he brought us all up in this land of opportunities. And um, the government has sent us me and and few of my siblings abroad for our graduate studies. Some came with PhDs, some some the lazy ones like me just came with the master's degree. Um, and uh, uh, but this is the land of opportunities. If we believe that from the beginning. Who who becomes from from a villagers, a farmer. Um, uh, Baker's son, who spent his life uh, educating us as much as possible to being, as you said, and thank you, and I humbly just uh, repeat that, being a managing partner of one of the top Saudi law firms, top global law firms uh, branching into Saudi. Uh, because this is the land of opportunities. It's not with one individual being brilliant. It is this, this land is brilliant. It makes everything easier if, if you are committed to doing it. And this kind of what pushed us into uh, going independent. Uh, uh, my belief is that we don't want babysitters. I, 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 don't, I don't need, at least from my perspective, and, I, and, and it's me, my partners, and, and our team, we don't need babysitters anymore. We don't need the international patronage of, of, uh, of global brands helping us in doing what we need to do. Uh, we're helping Saudi clients, or we're helping on Saudi mandates, we're helping domestic uh, instructions, or we're helping incoming international um, clientele and all of that requires local knowledge. Why do I need somebody in, 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 and no offense, but why do I need somebody in New York, Los Angeles, London, Shanghai to tell me how do I do this in my own jurisdiction? Um, if I haven't proven myself have been, uh, having practiced for the past 18 plus years that I can do it, then I'm a failure. And uh, I, I have to start stepping up for, for my own practice, for my own team, for my own generation that we Saudis, we Saudi lawyers, we can do it and we don't need the blessing of somebody else abroad uh, that for Saudi 100% local work that we need this to be um, kind of co-advised uh, by non-domiciled uh, uh, consultants. Uh, this is without uh, a doubt that we don't have all of the technical expertise and we don't have all of the technical knowledge and we are far from being a mature uh, uh, that we can be independent. We will need the international help as much as possible for all of the um, uh, uh, all of these technical projects that we're still learning and we're still innovating. The vision is all about things that we have never had before: uh, renewable and uh, uh, energy and clean energy and re uh, green Saudi and and the Giga projects. All of that we will never be able to do in ourselves. But the other things we can and we will do uh, independently. And I think this is, was the drive which, uh, be, uh, behind us going independent and creating um, this law firm, which uh, Sahel Partners. And Sahel is, is the star from the Saudi folklore that used to guide um, uh, the nomad and, and the villagers and, and the farmers alike um, uh, when a certain season has started or ended or if they get lost, where to go to, which translates to cannabis star uh, in, in, in English. Well, uh, this is exciting, Fahad, and, and I, uh, I wish you the best. I, I, I put my money on you. Thank you great, so much. I have great confidence. That's a huge burden. Thank you so much. How big is your firm, and um, uh, and how many uh, like how many people are working with you guys so far, and where do you sort of see it growing in the next year or so? 
So we, uh, our soft launch was 1st of November, actually. Uh, uh, and uh, our broke. official launch, thank you so much, Shukran. Um, and official launch will be 2nd of January. And that's when we are doing our kind of celebration and gathering and all of that. And, and so today we are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lawyers. Um, uh, nine to be completed by the official launch. So today we are operationally, we're, we're five and nine by the kickoff date um, with uh, two support teams. So all, all in all, we're 11 today between today and a couple of weeks uh, ahead of today. So it's team still joining us. So we haven't started as a one man show. We haven't started as, as right. uh, kind of we're trying our luck. No, it's a team that believed in the concept and we're coming together into it. Um, our focus is, is corporate and all things corporate, um, government advisory um, and dispute management. And hopefully uh, I, I'm, I've been bluffing about this a lot and hopefully I'm, I'm true about it. Uh, the first Saudi law firm to do lobbying in, in, in a sense, which is government compliant lobbying for full disclosure. So um, uh, it's kind of, we see uh, there is a lot uh, being missing in translation. Uh, and this is what you said earlier in this conversation, which is that, um, and you did uh, refer to that as well, Lucian, is that seeing is believing. So a lot, of, a lot of our clients, they don't understand what's going on in Saudi. They think it's all about technical or commercial or legal advisory uh, that will solve their issues and problems. They miss the social angle. They miss the political angle. They miss who needs to be approached on what topic and who needs to be asked what sort of questions. Uh, and this is where we're trying to fill in the gap as much as possible. We think delivery is not only answering the question, but letting the client know what sort of and what kind of questions need to be asked. Fascinating. Yeah, that's brilliant. So for any uh, international corporates listening, um, you've just heard a really good pitch. So, uh, Suhail Partners in <laughs> Riyadh. Suhail um, Partners. Can we, can we contact information coming? <laughs> we'll, we'll put that in there. <laughs> um, and we should have men mentioned that none of this is investment advice. This is just a conversation. Um, we've gotten, uh, we just got to make sure we say that. Um, but, uh, that's fascinating and congratulations to you guys. Shukran. Shukran. Thank you so much. Uh, I didn't see that coming. Wallahi, but yeah. um, <laughs> well, we like to keep you on your toes, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to shale in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um, we've talked a lot about shale on this podcast so far. We've mostly discussed U.S. shale, but Saudi Arabia is making a shale gas play within the kingdom's borders on the eastern province, the Jafura shale field. Um, is uh, expected to yield up to 2 billion cubic feet of gas um, and contribute a significant amount of ethane, gas liquids, condensates by 2030. Aramco is really beginning to accelerate the company's development of these unconventional resources. Just this week, Aramco awarded $10 billion in EPC contracts for work at the field. The project will expand its gas production while also providing feedstock to support its growth in chemicals and hydrogen sectors. Just very interesting stuff going on with Aramco right now. One cannot accuse them of just sitting on their hands and pumping oil. They're really diversifying right now. Of course, uh, one interesting thing about this as well is that fracking, um, which is happening here in the United States, uses a lot of water, which is one thing that Saudi Arabia does not have a ton of. Um, Richard, let me kick it to you here. This is exciting and interesting stuff that uh, Aramco is doing. It is. Uh, let's look at it just from the fossil fuel aspect uh, the production is expected to commence in 2024 so it's it, you know it's it was delayed a little bit but it started up in 2024 and when we're talking about the two billion cubic feet we're talking about the the levels they hope to get to by 2030 so they won't come out of the gate at that but if you get to full production that two billion cubic feet of gas is about 20 percent of current production the 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 production of ethane that would come out of Jafura would be about 40% of current production, and the, and the gas liquids and content, condensates would be about 34% of current production. So this is huge. Um, the, uh, one of the big aspects of this is um, it it's forecast to uh, eliminate 300,000 to 500,000 uh, barrels a day used for domestic. This is of crude and and. And that's a, it's a big deal in terms of Saudi Arabia's efforts to decarbonize. And we've talked about this in the past. I mean, Saudi Arabia really, it's a gargantuan task. I mean, Saudi Arabia burns 3.5 million barrels per day of oil and gas liquids to, you know, to, to heat homes and to, I mean, cool homes, <laughs> don't heat homes. But 
uh, you know, for domestic consumption, and, and we mentioned that's more than Japan, Russia, or Germany, or Brazil. Uh, and so if you, can, if you can back that down with natural gas, which is still a fossil fuel, but it's, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a much, a much uh, it's a reduced carbon emitter from, from crude. So that's a big step. Uh, the other thing is, I, I like you know these long-term projects. So this is a this is they expect to spend uh, you know the investment over so ten billion just went out, uh, and that went to uh, I think uh, sixteen or so companies uh, that are going to do engineering, procurement, and construction contracts. And some of them, you know, Schlumberger is involved, Halliburton's involved, which is awesome. We, Baker Hughes, which we like, we like U.S. companies, and we like U.S. companies involved in these long-term projects because. So many of the best relationships with the U.S. and Saudi Arabia come through business and defense and, and oil and that sort of thing. So these are long-lasting relationships on a long-term project. Um, you know, and they're planning to spend, you know, over that 10, you know, a, a 68 billion, but up to 100 billion on this. So this is a huge commitment. They seem to feel, you know, fracking has not been done successfully outside of the U.S., uh, not in a, in a broad scale. They seem to feel that they've really reduced the... Um, the cost of it, they feel confident they can use seawater for it, um, and that um, it's it's technically feasible for them to do this. So, um, you know, it's an exciting project in, in any number uh, of regards. Not only, as I said, in offsetting oil consumption domestically, and the big thing here is it's, it's a non-associated gas field. So, so much of their gas is associated with crude oil production, so they can get this gas without having to produce any more oil, uh, and. It also helps them, uh, you know, move towards their their climate commitments. So uh, fascinating project. Not not my territory, not my game at all. But I just gonna pick it up from from where Richard has ended is that uh, there is a lot of cross interdependencies between the projects in Saudi, and you don't need to look at whatever is being announced in Saudi in silos. So you don't look uh, at a different and what's happening that it, it is an Aramco independent gas project or gas project. Uh, it, it, you need to look at the sequence of announcements, um, Green Saudi and the event that has happened um, three or a month ago, three weeks ago or a month ago, and then the announcement of this and then what to follow when it comes to um, gas emissions and what happens in all of that. It is kind of a, a, a network of of projects that uh, are showing the commitment of Saudi when it comes to whatever mandate they want to announce. And I, I came to that realization when we were not summoned, but we were requested by our uh, regulator, the Saudi, uh, uh, the Saudi Bar Association. Uh, it, it just came calling for all of us who even remotely know anything about energy. Um, please uh, reach out to us and let us know if you know anything about energy, we need to create a registry for all Saudi uh, lawyers who are involved in, in, in energy and environment, because a lot is going to happen in 2022 in, in that platform, which tells you that, um, it, again, it's not all in silos. Each project is, is interdependent on the other, one way or the other. You know, uh, Fahad, it's been really interesting doing this podcast, and Lucian, I think you'll agree. Uh, we've touched on uh, just a, a, already a, a tremendous range of topics, you know, all, you know, like the, the COP26 and, and and you know uh, global energy conversion and where Saudi fits in all this but a lot of it ends up being so Saudi Arabia has become a master of these these huge announcements of these huge projects but a lot of our conversations uh, end up sort of deconstructing w w what the project is where it fits in the bigger plan uh, the feasibility of it the you know the why you know both the external consequences and the internal consequences so um, in trying to make sense of all that's going on in Saudi Arabia and all that's being announced, uh, and that's, that's taken up a lot of our time because it's, they're so busy right now doing these things. You know, and you, you know, Lucian, we, we didn't even, the hydrogen aspect, aspect of this. And, we didn't even get, get there yet. <laughs> we didn't even get there, yeah. So, I mean, and, 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 and Saudi Arabia is looking, uh, looking to get into blue hydrogen, which, which this is perfectly suited for because you know, uh, carbon captured natural gas is the feedstock for blue hydrogen and, and ammonia. And so that's the next step. And this is interesting, you know, so, so it's step by step. So, you know, if you're, you know, the perfect world, everything is green hydrogen or, or something else, some renewable energy. Um, and Saudi Arabia has said all along, we can't get there right now. 
but we will take steps you know, like going from you know reducing our crude oil consumption for domestic purposes and you know uh, we're already we we're, you know we, we think we can we can generate renewable energies that's sufficient for green hydrogen in time once some of the technology with elect electrolyzers comes along but you know in the interim we can do blue hydrogen which is you know natural gas carbon captured blue hydrogen and we're going to start doing that so these are, you know, these are significant steps, interim steps, but, you know, again, on the way to something hopefully even greater. Let's move on to our final topic here. Um, awesome. Let's jam about the Saudi economy in 2022. <laughs> You'd have to say that right now, Saudi Arabia is in a very strong position. Getting down to brass tacks, we have the Saudi government forecasting growth in 2022 at 7.5%. World Bank's latest is 4.9%, Jed One Investment, 7% uh, year on year. The consensus is not in the number, but in the sentiment. The kingdom is set for a pretty strong year economically, Omicron and other externalities notwithstanding. Yeah. Um, Fahad, we were talking a little bit earlier about the sort of dynamic feeling on the ground in Riyadh, but there also seems to be a lot of excitement about the economy in general. Um, is that sort of what you're experiencing right now? And if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be awesome. Uh, well, I, um, I don't want to be uh, the cheesy marketing individual, but we, as, as Richard said, uh, I grow independent from a stable law, law firm and, and went to set up my own law firm uh, in, in collaboration with, with a big, uh, a good, good number of team, um, team members who believed in this. Uh, um, I don't think we would do that if we don't believe that 2022 is going to be a positive year. Uh, so, uh, uh, and this is the sentiment in, on the ground here. Uh, and you need to bear in mind that we are not an international law firm and we, we don't have global bailing and we don't have an affiliation that is paying our, our sellers or all that. We, 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 we just roll our sleeves high and, and we do it ourselves. And this is exactly what is the sentiment on the ground here. Uh, this is the sentiment in Riyadh. This is the sentiment in Jeddah. I was conversating, conversating via text with somebody in Khobar a couple of days ago, and this is exactly the sentiment there. Everybody is is um, is happy and queer about what 2022 is going to bring in uh, uh, in terms of, of uh, all the debts will be paid uh, for, for what COVID has done to us in 2022, 2020 and 2021. Uh, in terms of, of psychological effect and uh, what what we've suffered over the past three or four years in terms of economic uh, kind of hit one way or the other because of the government reform. Um, so from, from a generic holistic point of view, uh, I would say from the technocrats and from the pragmatic uh, individuals, yes, the sentiment is positive. Uh, um, uh, and there is also a, a bureaucratic shakeup as well, uh, where they also kind of retreating all of the mistakes they've done over the past few years in terms of uh, higher pay scales or uh, over hiring and all of that where they are kind of restructuring their approach of, of the economy and the market and uh, and job uh, and employment and all of that and you see a lot of repositioning of of the uh, job market as well or the career market as well in Saudi. so we uh, we would say that 2022 is is it's not reaping the fruits but it's getting closer to the fruits where it gives you that further push to the years to follow that you're seeing, you're seeing that there is not a light at the end of the tunnel. It's a bright, bright light as well. Um, uh, now, where we're seeing that happening is that we are working on projects for the past two or three years, and this is delivery time. Uh, so it, it, as, as Richard has said that you see all of these big announcements, uh, but you, you don't see a lot of deliveries because everybody is busy. But how do you get how how is that being proven? Um, well, we will be delivering. In 2022, you will see the laws and regulations has finally been drafted and delivered and approved and, and processed. You will see uh, uh, the, the technical and the uh, experts uh, in, in the strategic uh, advisors have delivered their uh, strategies for the uh, breakdown of the, all the mega and giga projects and the master plans and all of that. Um, and then you will see all of these master plans for the projects that have been approved two, three or four years. Um, you will see uh, them in operation and and uh, uh, the kickoff uh, um, kind of uh, happened in 2022, which is uh, when all of us kind of 
the bad individuals, the consultants, we take a lot of time in drafting and arguing and counter-arguing and fighting. <laughs> and we deliver by the end of this year or mid next year, then we hand it over to, to the actual delivery individuals or uh, construction and contracting and 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 all of those you will you will start seeing the tower getting higher you you will see the evidence of of all of these an, an, uh, announcements uh, uh, fascinating and 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 i wish we could do a game show ding 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 for a great response or the you know the the, the spot on response uh, you know what i get i get, i'm sort of consistent i hope here lucian uh about what pleases me about this judwa report and judwa does great work um we know in the macro that that you know oil is oil revenues are up. We, you know we saw you know OPEC plus mm -hmm. squeeze the markets to to get down the oversupply. Now um, you know uh, global trade and global commerce is coming back. U.S. shale is is belated and coming back. So it's so so you know it's just this is sort of um, these are great times for Saudi oil revenues. Um, so that's good. Uh, and that paired with what we've talked about was the increase in non-oil income. I guess it was 85 billion in, in 2020. It'll be more this year. Huge in terms of their meeting their budget demands. But here's what I love about that Jedwa report: government expenses were down three percent year on year in the year to Q3 2021. Overall, despite uh, de uh, detailing higher than budgeted government expenditure, expenditure for 2021 as a whole, it will still be 6% lower than last year. Looking out into 2022, government expenditure is expected to decline by another 6% year on year, reflecting the Ministry of Finance's more prudent approach to fiscal affairs in line with the fiscal sustainability VRP, the Vision uh, Realization Program. So, so, and, and, and Fahad alluded to it, you know, in the past, when there's a windfall or a series of windfalls in terms of revenue, the the, Saudi, the government would you know hire more in the public sector, and these are these are highly inefficient, lingering costs, and they're not doing that, and they're really sustaining uh, some fiscal discipline, and I think that's huge, and uh, really important for them going forward. So I mean, again, like I said, I think I've been consistent, and this is what pleases me most is the is the commitment to being disciplined in the, in the budget and in government expenses and not backtracking just because there's a, a, a revenue windfall. Fahad, thank you so much for your valuable time today. Um, and for all of our listeners, um, you can subscribe to this podcast at 966.transistor.fm um, or on YouTube. Uh, we usually have the video appear shortly after the audio. But um, if you are a YouTube viewer, uh, check us out there and subscribe there if you can. Fahad, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Much appreciated, Richard and Lucian. This was really brilliant. And well, thank you pleasure. for spending the time and the effort for, for my country and nation. We will invite you back, uh, Fahad, for sure. So you, you don't have to come back, but we'll, we'll certainly invite you. And because and, we love to talk to you anyway as a friend, but uh, your expertise is invaluable. An absolute honor. Uh, anytime. Thank you so much.